Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Today, we are talking with uh, Olivier Aranda, who is a history teacher and PhD candidate at the Pavillon Savant. Uh, and his specialty, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to scare anybody, is the French Navy of the of the revolutionary period. Uh, all of my all of my pro British friends have just gasped in horror and and fled. <laughs> 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 all the Nelson fans <laughs> are outraged. <laughs> Uh, Olivier, uh, it's such a pleasure to talk to you today. I'm very excited to learn about this. Thank you very, thank you very much, Josh, to, to, to give me this opportunity because uh, it's very important to me to address uh, Spanish, uh, an English-speaking audience because, uh, well, the, the public in France is quite um, narrow <laughs> for this mm -hmm. kind of, of history. Uh, so uh, I'm looking up to, to British uh, British historiography, British uh, public, and uh, it's uh, for me it's an honor. Really, thank you. Uh, absolute pleasure, as I said. Um, I'm sure that the audience, because well, the audience in Britain certainly loves things about the uh, this period in history, so I'm sure they will be actually joking aside, really enjoy it. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you. So, um, to begin with. Uh, can you tell us a little about what the Navy was like before the revolution Yeah, uh, and sort of what was its strengths and, and, and what did it do? <laughs> well, uh, the French Navy, uh, of course, uh, took a, a great part in the, uh, the War of American Independence. It's uh, supposed to be the golden age of our Navy. Of course, half the books written on the uh, French Navy uh, deals with this period because it's, uh, our, it's supposed to be our golden era, but I quite disagree with it. What is what are the strengths of the French Navy? You, you know some of them. You maybe you know all of them. It's of course the quality, the the, uh, the quality of the ships, the, the men of war, the ships of the line are very well built. Uh, with very scientific uh, plans, uh, a, a great method of um, of, um, of working, but um, the recent historiography has uh, emphasized the importance of um, of craft. Um, of of course, the the French uh, the French build very good um, very good plans, very scientific, but Craftsmanship, craftsmanship is also very important, and British craftsmanship is way better. Is better, uh, so it's very important. Um, you you can start um, you can start the history of the navy of the revolution before the revolution, of course. Uh, 1786 is a good starting point because um, the it's a, a turning point because of. Uh, because it emphasizes the qualities and the defects of the French Navy. Uh, of course, it's uh, the moment of, uh, of uh, how can I say that? Uh, it's when the French Navy adopts uniform, uh, uniform plans for mm -hmm. their ships. But also, there's two weaknesses of the French Navy. It is, of course, the ships are copper sheathed as you know. But unlike in Britain, the ships are not copper bolted. It's very important. Uh, throughout the, re the revolutionary years, uh, up to 1795, the, the French ships remain iron bolted. So that explains a lot of uh, sinking, a lot of shipwrecks, because the, it's a real defect. And of course, the French historiography as to this day, has not, of course, underlined this point uh, too much, uh, but it's very important. Second mm -hmm. point, second defect, hidden defect, in fact, of the French Navy, it's about the well-known caronade. I, I don't know if you pronounce that, the caronade <laughs> in French. You, 
I must say that you say it much better than I say it. We just say carronade, but yeah, it carronade. sounds nice. It sounds nicer in French. The <laughs> <laughs> carronade, the carronade are not adopted by the French Navy until uh, 1805, at least. It's mm. very important, and few French scholars uh, know it. Why? Because in 1790, uh, in 1787, the French adopted um, a kind of uh, mortar, a kind of mortar. Uh, called a 36 pounder. It's not a carronade. It's not a mortar. It's a very bad. It's a very bad piece of artillery. There is some in uh, in um, in the French museums. Some in the British museums as well. I think <laughs> because uh, for obvious reasons. And, uh, uh, it's not. It's not a, a good. Um, it's not a, a good uh, piece of artillery. Why is it? Uh, why am I stressing these points? Because of course. Um, and I'm jumping to my next point, uh, as we discussed it before. You've got to understand uh, something very important: is the the French Navy uh, has been seen on the monarchist period as its golden age. So French historians, when they are monarchists, have uh, have not have have hidden these facts. It's very important. Because um, the, friend, the history of the French Navy was written first in the 19th century by French monarchists. Because uh, we, it's, uh, it's almost the same thing in Britain, I think. Uh, the first historians of the Navy were naval officers themselves. So um, it's, uh, it's the same thing in France. But um, as you know, uh, uh, all of the 19th century of France is a struggle between between republicans and um, and uh, monarchists, but the, the historians of the navy were monarchists. So the French navy, up to the 20th century, have had no defenders, no barristers, no uh, I, uh, <laughs> no historians. All the historians had just one objective to say. Oh, uh, those damn leftists uh, killed our navy. <laughs> so, so I'm pretty. Uh, I'm uh, pointing it bluntly, but it's it's, mm -hmm. it's the point. So uh, it's very important to understand it because hence the emphasis on the uh, Navy of the uh, American independence hailed as a uh, glorious, uh, uh, everything you can say about it, it's marvelous. But in fact, no, it had a very uh, few defects. Uh, uh, the French Navy during the, uh, the War of Independence did not win uh, any destructive battle. Of course, uh, the Battle of the Saint, I don't know how you say it in, in English, uh, the Battle of the Saint. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we call it the Battle of the Saints. Yeah, the Battle of the Saints. Same thing, same thing. Uh, yes, the same thing. Was a, a French defeat. So um, a bit of perspective is important to understand that, uh, of course, well, the, the French historians have said, uh, have exercised them uh, to death to say, to, to, um, to, uh, to strengthen the difference between these two navies, but they are the same, they are French navy, of course there are differences, but not as much as some would like. Mm -hmm. Interesting, that's a very interesting. Uh what you say about the strengths and weaknesses of, of the old Navy. Uh, I have, because uh, this is very new to me, all this subject, so uh, I, have no, I have no preconceptions about, uh, about these things, but I do know, I, I do, yes, I have heard in my reading about the, uh, about the American War of Independence that the French Navy, that, that's the, 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 the grand period of the French yeah. Navy, uh, because uh, of the fact that they they uh, they defeated or drove off um, uh, the British Navy at Yorktown, and yeah. but it's very interesting what you say about the 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 the, cut, the fastenings on the sheathing and um, this very strange cannon. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it actually is, is, is it actually a mortar? Is it like a proper mortar that fires? It was not a proper motor, but uh, you have you've got to look at it. <laughs> it's a, it's it's supposed to fire indirectly, 
So it uh -huh. is true, but of a, of a strange manufacture, uh, but it, it does not look like a caronade at all. So the difference is very clear. Um, and uh, it's, it's because, uh, you know, we have a small historiography of the French Navy, so very few offers. So the, that's uh, the, um, the origin of a mistake. But it, you can't you can't miss you can't miss it uh, when you you see a French caronet because they exist they exist later and when you see this um, what they call a, a, a 36, 36 pounder caronet the French name is Obusier caronade so something mm -hmm. like a, a mortar caronade so it, it does not make sense in fact <laughs> <laughs> okay right. Um, uh, do you want to uh, talk a little about the that historiography that you mentioned um, for our for our English audience? Yeah, but um, what I want to stress to our English speaking audience is the the very different nature nature of uh, the French historiography of the army and the French historiography of the navy. There is, of course. In Britain too, there's differences. Okay, but in France, uh, it's it's very different because you've got to understand that the revolutionary armies and, of course, the Napoleonic armies are part of the national uh, identity. When you're French, every French um, um, every French uh, pupil uh, knows. About Austerlitz, well, I'm a military teacher. Uh, I can tell you they're not obsessed about it at all. Uh, uh, <laughs> but they they know of Napoleon, they know of Austerlitz. But so you've got we have uh, so much historians about the the, the the army operations, even the revolutionary period, not only the Napoleonic period. But it's quite the opposite. Uh, about the Navy. So much because I want to stress again, maybe I'm repeating myself, but it's very important, the political divide is absolutely fundamental. Uh, I don't know who you mm -hmm. say it in. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Because um, there, were, there are many Republican historians of the French army, of course, because they have won everything. But uh, Nobody uh, wants to embrace defeat, so there were no Republican, um, um, there were no Republican historians of the French Navy. That's why the first, <clears throat> the first works of scholarship of the French Navy were in English. So uh, I've, that's why um, you mentioned later, uh, you mentioned earlier that there were there is a, a lot of jokes about the French Navy. Of course, I know, uh, you know, but I've, I've got no problem with uh, English speaking historiography. It is, in fact, way better than the French because the French want to make a political point. Uh, when Ma, uh, how do you say Ma, uh, James uh, Alfred Taylor Mayan, Ma, uh -huh. uh, the, the the American uh, the American historian of the navy, the yeah. creator of the concept of uh, command of the sea, when mm -hmm. he writes about the French Revolution and the navy, he does not want to to make a political point about left and right. So his work is way better than the French work of his period. The first landmark work about the French navy is in the nineteen in nineteen fifty. It's by Norman Hampson, Norman Hampson, a British, a British person. Mm -hmm. um, it's an excellent work. It has, of course, the defects of its period. It's very Marxist, very Marxist. He does, uh, he has little interest in the fighting. He prefers to talk about uh, the shipyards, uh, the arsenals. So, but it's a, a, an excellent work by a British person. So um, th that's very, very interesting. Nowadays, nowadays, there are still people who, um, in France, who say uh, um, uh, the French Revolution destroyed the navy because they were leftists, uh, they did not respect anything. And my work, my, my work is to, of course, uh, mitigate these mm. accusations. But it's not, um, it's very important, I'm not fighting the English historiography, not at all. 
Mm -hmm. I'm, in fact, I, I'm always, um, I'm always quoting. Uh, um, je m'appuie dessus. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm working with the, the British, the English-speaking historiography to mm -hmm. mitigate some cliché about uh, the French name. So uh, that, that's an important point. That's a very interesting point, and I will I will remember it myself when when I inevitably start to looking into some of the things you talk about. <laughs> But uh, so um, on that score, I mean, there are a lot of it's, it's absolutely true that I mean, that, that's very that is a very enlightening concept that English historiography isn't necessarily um, I don't know what the word is overly negative, but uh, it does it does fall into uh, accepting some myths and things and, and, yep. and tropes about about yep. the, about the what, French. What? Of course, the British historiography, in fact, um, most British uh, historians uh, do not read French. So uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. It's, uh, not, not an accusation at all. <laughs> uh, I, I feel I must apologize because I really should. I was reading, uh, I mean, but I can't say that you have to really search. Yes, you have to really search for books about the French Navy yeah. in Britain. I mean, they're not just in bookstores because it's sort of a specialist subject. And I think the reason the British people care about the French Navy is they want to know who the who Nelson was fighting essentially. Yeah. You know, um, who and and how they fought him, sort of yeah. thing. When I uh, want, one thing about this, when I wanted to get uh, funding. For my PhD, uh, for my PhD, I said one thing to the panel. Uh, I said, um, "But when to make war, you've got to be two. So mm. if, the, if the British are uh, emphasizing, uh, stressing the importance of their navy, it's of course uh, very normal. But it, it would it would not be so glorious. Uh, the Nile would not be so glorious if they had no opposition. So that's uh, mm. that one can." Uh, my point, in fact. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and so, speaking to some of the things that we get in the books that are available, I mean, there's a, there's a handful that I know of. Um, I was looking in a book. I think it's by, I think it's by Terry Crowdy, and he's more of a of an army historian um, of the French of, of the French army, but historian of the French army. But he. he 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 makes the, he does make the same point that the revolution ruined a good navy and um, that's not true. Uh, he, he, <laughs> uh, he, I was suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, I had a feeling, <laughs> uh, and he also made he also gave some some stats some numbers um, about. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you know about the. Uh, it's a common topic about how how all the officers on in the French Navy were noblemen or or from the gentry, and when they left, confusion reigned, and that's yeah. one of the big things. What yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, what's one uh, of course? What's one of the big topics? What's one uh, of the big accusation instrumentalized by the French far right, right or far right in the 19th century to say? Uh, these um, these leftists uh, they have uh, they have destroyed a great uh, a great core of officers. So it's very interesting. So in fact, most of the noble men uh, left France themselves before any obligation. Be why? It's very understandable. Um, you don't have to judge them, of course, because mm. they did not they, do, they, they did not uh, of course swear or feel any allegiance to the French Republic because the French Republic was um, uh, based on, uh, of course, a culture of equality, a culture of, um, of uh, abolition of uh, the privileges. That's the nice uh, way of saying it. Some would say uh, the French Republic was uh, uh, keen on replacing people with abilities with people who just knew how to talk of course you know and of course i disagree but this argument is uh, very um, hearable <laughs> uh, you can so you you can just say no this is uh, this is far right no no you you've got of course to deal with it so uh, 
to the facts. Um, uh, merely, merely 80, 90 percent of the French Corps of Officers left the Navy. So it's huge. It's, uh, of course, uh, hugely significant. They were replaced. Uh, first thing, could, mm -hmm. could they have uh, stayed? Could, could they have stayed? No, that's very important. Uh, they were not uh, they were not usable by the French Republic because uh, their families had already had already gone to Germany or to England, so it would have been very um, very difficult. The the crews it's very important to understand the crews did not want uh, officers noblemen, so it's not it's not the the convention it's not the French uh, authorities who said uh, no more nobles. It's the, the crews, the crews themselves, they do, did not want to obey to a nobleman because they had had enough of, of them, of course. You, you got to understand that um, the French noble is not the English nobleman. Um, the English nobleman, from what I know, uh, maybe I'm mistaken, he, there's more of a culture of um, seamanship, common seamanship. Um, an English seaman, an English officer, a sea officer, would maybe defend um, a seaman because there are this common, uh, this common work, um, this common work, this common way of life. It's mm -hmm. not that neat in the French Navy. The, the gap between officers and uh, seamen is bigger. So uh, the, 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 the officers, the noblemen, could not have been used by the French Republic. So uh, there is no choice. So it's the first thing to understand. They were replaced. They were replaced by officers, what we call officier bleu, blue officers. Why? Because they were officers who had a, a, a temporary commission mm -hmm. during the, the war of independence. They had um, small commandments, small uh, uh, or small ships, frigates uh, at the maximum. They were so blue officers because they had a blue coat opposite to the red coat of the, uh, the officers of the Grand Corps, the great, uh, the great corps of the, the, the French Navy, the noblemen. So mm -hmm. they were, uh, it's very important, they were very competent officers. Um, they were not uh, landmen, of course, but I'm, I'm obliged to say it because some believe it. Uh, some people believe it. In France, I don't know what it is in Britain, of course they were officers, they were, um, they were mostly competent. The, the superior officers was what we call the admirals, the admirals of the French Revolution were all um, um, those who were extracted from the blue officers, they were all excellent. It's interesting mm -hmm. because when you, when you think about the French Navy during the revolution, you think about the defeat. There are, of course, but you, um, I don't know a single time when you can blame the officer for the defeat, apart from the Nile. But in the Nile, it's very, understand, it's very important to understand that the, the commanding officer, Bruet, was not, was not an, uh, an officer of the revolution. He was, uh, he was an officer of the Ancien Régime, of the old regime, who was taken back uh, during uh, the later period. So it's very important. The, 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 because one thing is very important. It, when you think of a revolution, you think of the army, the, the soldiers who became like Napoleon, like Osh, who became mm -hmm. uh, general very quickly. As you know, Napoleon was a general at, 20, at 23 years old. So why not the same thing in the Navy? Why not very successful officers? The answer, of course, by the traditional historiography, is that you know the navy is much more technical. The navy, the navy, you can't just become an, a, a sea officer like that. It's true. It, it is true, but not as much as you can think, because mm -hmm. there has been officers who uh, have climbed the the the, the, the stairs. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they have become quite successful officers. I'm thinking of. Villaret Joyeuse, Villaret Joyeuse was a lieutenant in 1792 
Two years later, he is commanding in chief the French Navy of Brest. So it's absolutely amazing. He did a really good work. Of course, he did not destroy one on one the, French, the British Navy, of course, but that does not. In, um, he was, uh, for example, he was the commanding officer in the glorious 1st of June. And uh, he was 40 years old. Two years before, he was not even commanding a frigate. So, uh, you, but so he, he made uh, quite a good, uh, made, made quite a good, uh, a good work. And uh, there is plenty like him: Nelly, Van Stabel, uh, Van Dongen. Those officers were quite good. And uh, again, uh, during the, this first period, this period of the national convention, there is defeat by France. But I can I don't think you can name one officer. Um, officer uh, promoted very quickly, uh, who is responsible mm -hmm. alone for defeat. So it's very important. Mm -hmm. Right. I, so, I, I'm sorry, just, just one thing. Don't, yeah. just, my research tend to uh, show, of course, you, everybody has the right to disagree, the, the French problems of the Navy were not or very uh, slightly about the officers. The officers were not the problem. Uh, you can, of course, there were a, there was uh, a thing common to the um, to the French army. There were there were French officers held back by the Ancien Regime. Uh, a man like Nielly, uh, Jacques Nielly, who was a French admiral, he was. Uh, if it were not for the revolution, he would have been a, a, a captain or something like that. Thanks to the French Revolution, he became an admiral and he took part in several taking of, of British convoys, etc. etc. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. I mean, but it's 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 interesting. It's actually, I, I find the motive for the old, um, uh, it quotes, uh, Grand Corps, uh, leaving France, uh very interesting when put like that because uh, from your just to give the the french republican government a fair say you can't have people like that in charge of ships of war you can't trust them that they won't yeah. just sail to britain and say here have five ships and it, it happened <laughs> it happened in 1792 uh, in 1792 uh, after the proclamation of the republic uh, in saint domingue so in the, in the caribbean mm -hmm. The one of the ship of the line, La Ferme, it's, it's called La Ferme because uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a very complicated French uh, way of retrieving um, uh, um, tax, so not important. Mm -hmm. La Ferme, uh, it's the name of the ship of the line of 74 cannons. He was taken by his aristocrat officer to uh, the Spanish. So, of course, the, the National Convention could not say, oh, let's get on. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course, they had to change uh, the officers. But uh, mm -hmm. just one thing, the officers changed, were not uh, beheaded. Uh, was, that's, uh, mm -hmm. of course, that's not a legend, but no officer were uh, guillotined <laughs> uh, because of um, political, uh, because of failure in action or because of, um, or because of, um, it's political opinion within mm -hmm. uh, within the realm of the republic. Because of course you had uh, you had naval officers who were put to the scaffold, but not as uh, not as naval officers. They were put mm -hmm. to the scaffold as emigres, uh, mm -hmm. as people who had left France to fight against France. And of course, uh, when, uh, that did not please uh, the National Convention. <laughs> it's treason. So yeah. <laughs> It's treason. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, more understandable, and that's very different from, say, generals of the army who, who if they lost too many battles, yep. could yep. end up being behead beheaded. Yep. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, how? So you you said that it wasn't necessarily the officers who were the problem with the French Navy. Yeah. Um, why don't we talk about the crews a little and sort of how they were recruitment and and I've heard uh, I read about this thing called the inscription maritime. Uh, what is that? So, what was the problem of the French Navy? Uh, 
one thing is, of course, the superiority of the British Navy, better crews, better officers. Of course, I'm not saying, I'm saying the French officers were good. I'm not saying they were better mm -hmm. than the British. And, uh, mm -hmm. They were consistently less, uh, less, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, of less, uh, less quality. But so, the, the, the most important fact about the, the French Navy uh, during this period, and it's quite hard to understand, a bit hard to understand to, from a, for a British person, is the Vendée. It's the Vendée, uh, the yeah. Vendée uprising and the Chouin uprising in Brittany. Mm -hmm. Why? Because mm -hmm. uh, it's there that were recruited most of the crews. Mm -hmm. It's um, And the line of communications were cut short by the, uh, by the, the, the Vendée. When you want to send an order from Paris to Brest to say, uh, let's get on, uh, let's uh, the fleet out uh, to, to chase some British <laughs> merchantmen. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, sometimes orders were intercepted. The men could not, go, the men were not in favor of a revolution, so they would not go into the, 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 the cruise, into the, the man of war, the men of war. So it's very, it's, it's the most important strategic uh, thing about this period. Think, think uh, about the French Revolution. You can think England, think of England, who would be invaded by Scotland, Wales, and in the middle of that, you've got Somerset or Devon, who is in a complete uprising, and you can't send, um, you can't send orders. The sailors are mutinying. So you can understand it's a bit complicated. So it's very mm -hmm. important because the moves of the uh, the moves of the French fleet from 1793 to 1795 were all about the Vendée. It, the one uh, the objective given by the the committee of public safety, uh, Comité de salut public, to mm -hmm. the French uh, to the French navy was at no cost uh, the the British the British must not join the Vendée. So that's the number one objective. So I'm, cer I'm circling back to your question. The mm -hmm. crews were... That's a very good, very good point, though, because that's something that I, I know about the Vendée, yeah. but I, don't, I didn't put that together for some reason. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's very difficult, for, uh, it's very difficult for, um, for someone who is not French, because this is the Frenchest thing. Uh, the Vendée... Uh, uh, you've got to have a genuine interest in the history of France. It's the same thing for the French. The French uh, and, par for example, Irish history. They do not. Uh, French people do not know Irish history. They think so, um, the, for the 1798 rebellion, it's very uh, hard to understand because Catholic dissenter, uh, some mm -hmm. these things. So it's the same thing about the Vendée. Uh, you, you cannot be expert of everything. So that's uh, that's why we discuss it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thank you again. So um, the crews were uh, the crews were of poor quality because of political dissension. First, uh, people uh, who were royalists who did not want to uh, to fight for the republic because of underfunding, underfunding which is um, which is permanent. In fact, uh, during all the period of the revolution, so there was a problem of uh, of of the crews a bit more than the officers, but. The main problem of the French Navy is not uh, is a bit of everything, a bit of the officers, a bit of the crews. But it's uh, f firstly it's the strategic it's a strategic situation with the Vendée, with the, uh, the uprising, and uh, but uh, and we uh, well, we can discuss it now uh, if you want because it's the core of my PhD. So I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to it to the, the strategic question of the French Navy. Yeah, uh, the inscription item team is. Um, is something very French uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, let's get to this cliche: uh, the British uh, are something. The British, when they want to crew their their men of war, are very uh, uh, eff efficient. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they are something. Uh, uh, of course, in in French, we call it la presse, the press gangs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are very efficient. In France. It's, it's more French, it's more administrative. So you've got um, something of, of a conscription. I don't know if you, it, if it translates 
Well, so every seaman, every seaman is put on a register and is due to be uh, to go to the um, to go to the to the ships whenever war breaks out. And it's quite a very good system. In fact, it was one of the, because uh, it's an advantage in the early stages of a war because uh, uh, the British have to wait for the merchant men to return, and then they press the uh, they press the um, the crews and they get and then no problem. But the French uh, uh, everything is ready at the beginning of the war. And it's important because uh, some said, some French historians said the revolution was very bad because they threw even that advantage that we had because the political turmoil was so intense that in 1793, it's not untrue, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, get our fleet early before the British. Of course, uh, that's, uh, of course uh, that's, not, uh, that's not untrue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, that is a very. It, 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 I think <laughs> in 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 a world in, in a France that is not completely confused and in chaos politically yeah. speaking, yeah. it's a very it is a very good system to yeah. be honest. Uh, I think that's 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 fair to say, um, and I don't think a lot of people know about that way of, of recruiting people for the French Navy, because that's very interesting. Very, very, uh, very briefly before we get on to the exciting question, um, what were, discipline in the Royal Navy is, is, is laid down in, in, in the rules and the, and the laws and the, and the, the way, uh, for, the, there was a set, set rules for, for, you know, punishment. It was in the King's, King's regulations uh, and the rules of war, which all captains read out at the yeah. beginning of their cruises, in order, and that gave them the power to 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 flog and punish and have trials and things like that. What uh, is what discipline like in the French Navy? So it's of course uh, uh, with the officers. It's one of the second uh, act of accusation against uh, the French Navy by the French historiography. Uh, they were uh, poor discipline. It's not true. In fact, it's uh, you've got to understand the timeline. The timeline. French discipline in the Navy collapsed in 1791-1792 during the vacancy, during the vacancy of power, when mm -hmm. there were no more real king, there were no authority of a strong republic. The, but from 1793 on, the discipline got back. So it's very important because to this day, you have not British historians, you have French historians who say uh, those uh, against those leftists, uh, they destroyed discipline, uh, they, they, would, uh, they would encourage the crews to not obey orders. Of course, that is absolutely untrue. But it took time, it took time from the, the, the collapse of 1792 to uh, the restoration of the discipline. It took time, of course, but and it had very a very strong impact on the health of the crew, because when you are not disciplined on a ship, if you don't, um, if you don't, you know, uh, like me, you, you have seen the, the movies and, and, and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, on a ship, you're constantly um, cleaning up. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, if the discipline collapses, you, you, you do not do it anymore. And that's one of the reasons of the epidemics in the French Navy, but I repeat, at the beginning of the period, because when the representatives on mission send, sent by the, the National Convention, the Committee of Public Safety, arrived in Brest, no more of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Jean Bon Saint André, I will talk about him uh, later. Jean Bon Saint André, who was sent um, by the Committee of Public Safety, he was having, of course, he was having none of it. He said, uh, back to, um, back to uh, the discipline. But not not a discipline, not a discipline of the Ancien Régime, of course. Jean Bon Saint André, and the, the, the curious thing is that it worked. He, 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 uh, he wanted, oh, that's my, my, of course, I'm a French Republican, so I, I think it's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> he, said, he said, you obey to the man no more, you obey to the law. So uh, you don't have to respect an officer because he's a uh, well, uh, well-born or something like that. 
we are French, we are all equals, but you have voted for me, I'm your representative, I have been democratically elected, so I'm, no, no, I'm telling you, you, you have to wash up uh, the deck. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it may seem um, not childish, but quite so, but it's very important because uh, uh, in France, uh, it's for us, it's very important because it's the building of the Republic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, a British person have to understand, of course, it, it can make smile, of course. Uh, to, today, uh, um, saying you're a Republican is, in France is, is, um, is uh, mandatory because if you are if you're not saying I love the Republic, I love the French Revolution, you're a far right extremist. So, 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 mm -hmm. it's very important because when uh, I when I write uh, when I write articles mm -hmm. about the uh, democracy, uh, not the democracy on the, on board, but about the Republican discipline. Of course, it has a, quite a success. Uh, whereas when I write about things that I like even more, uh, French strategy strategy and the uh, and the uh, battle fighting. It, <laughs> Less success. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're you're right. There is a great appeal to to uh, the the idea that you 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 obey the rank, yeah. not the man. Yeah. I mean, it helps if you respect the man, but that will come if you're a good leader. So. And of course, the important thing is that in France and in in revolutionary France and. As today, people think that in Britain uh, it was uh, uh, the lash and uh, every, mm -hmm. it was, and it's not true, of course, because yeah. in, it, it, it is partly true. But you you, you can um, it is partly true. But in Britain too, you had um, a system of uh, um, how do we say a non noble could get on with a, a great mm -hmm. career. So mm -hmm. so of course the cliché are uh, on both sides, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, je suis d'accord. It's a little bit of the things I can. I have I have tourist French. <laughs> I, it's a very good pronunciation, better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> so now the fun question: we we have a picture sort of of how the navy runs, how it is how how it is emerged from the the ancien regime through the beginning of the revolution. Now, what in 1793? War um, breaks out on a major scale, requiring a large effort from the French Navy. Yeah. So, what, what happens? What's, yeah. what's the plan? <laughs> so it's, of course, um, when we, we talked about a little, bit, a little bit earlier, I told you I wanted to, to stress this point because it's the core of my PhD dissertation, the French strategy. Um, you, the... The, re the regular scholarship about it, about the strategy, is uh, have been written by Mahan, Alfred Tayyar Mahan, in uh, his well-known work, um, French uh, French Navy, uh, the Revolution, and uh, Sea Power, Sea Power, and the French uh, and the French uh, Revolution. What does it say? It says uh, the uh, the biggest mistake of the French was. Throughout the, the 18th century, to not seek the battle to get command of the sea by destroying the opposite navy. What, uh, what of course, uh, in opposite, the British did uh, the, uh, the British uh, strategy uh, at some point was to uh, seek and destroy the French navy everywhere. Okay. So, um, and uh, was it true? It was partly true. The French Navy in, uh, in 1792, uh, had, at the beginnings, because of the problem of crews, had what I call, it's, it's really the heart of my PhD, an indirect strategy. What you, you can tell mission-based strategy or whatever you want, the core of the matter, of course, is that you don't seek to fight, you seek to hunt merchantmen, but I'm not talking of privateer. Huh? I'm talking of the mm -hmm. French Navy itself. You do understand that, but most people, because you're British, but of course for a Frenchman, it's very, it's very difficult because most Frenchmen just know about uh, 
when you talk about uh, the Navy, you, you talk about Jean Bart, uh, the, the, the privateers. So it's very, uh, for you, it's, it's easy, but for most French people, it's very difficult to understand that you can chase merchants while you're part of the regular Navy and not a privateer. So uh, what we call state privateering and not privateering, uh, of course, um, attack of convoys, uh, what what they call in French descent, so disembarkment uh, on some points. Of course, we'll talk maybe of the uh, of island. That's the indirect strategy. Everything but a stick and destroy strategy. So it was uh, it was a strategy in 1792. Uh, of course, Mahan, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Alfred Taylor Mahan says, uh, <laughs> <laughs> says that's, that's awful because if you hide from the fight, the fight will get to you. And it's true. It's true. It, you, you, uh, and the battle will be imposed upon you when you want it the less. Okay, it, it's, an, it's, a, it, it's an understandable. But what the, uh, the English speaking, uh, scholarship does not know is that in 1793 to 1794 there was a strategy of sea command by the national convention there was uh, of course it failed but the, its existence is very interesting the committee of public safety who has been uh, treated uh, like people who did not know anything about the navy in fact is the only uh, structure in the french uh, 18th century to have said quite clearly we have to get command of the sea from the British. How? By innovation. And we get uh, some uh, some viewers will know about the Jeune Ecole. The Jeune Ecole in the 19th century is uh, is a, 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 a naval, naval school who says um, we don't want battleships. We want uh, we want uh, small crafts. With big uh, big guns or torpedoes. Oh, okay. So what about the revolution? In the revolution, the committee of public safety betted, they, they counted on a new type of cannons with who, who would um, propel um, obus. How would you say that? Uh, explosive explosive uh, shell. Yeah, explosive shell. So it's quite groundbreaking. I don't know if you uh, these explosive shells have been. Uh, developed really in, a, in an efficient manner in 1820 by Pexence, I don't know, Pexence, Nouvelle Force Maritime, okay. But it was in fact first um, drafted in 1794-1795 and these shells were almost working and if they have worked it would have been uh, tremendous, of course. So, in 1795, in 1795, the Committee of Public Safety uh, redacted a real strategy of sea command, saying, in 1795, we will have control of the Mediterranean by sending a huge reinforcement with our new uh, shells, uh, our magic shells, okay? So that's, uh, I think, uh, it is uh, quite new because uh, you, uh, you will not have uh, heard about it. So an old accusation, an old accus accusation about the French Navy collapses. The French Navy, the French Revolutionary Navy, did seek the command of the sea. They failed, they failed because uh, the, the shell did not work, so to, uh, simply. Uh, during the battles of 1795 of Groix uh, and of, uh, the, of Toulon, the French, uh, the French Navy was beaten. Uh, they lost uh, three or four ships of the line. Not that much, but uh, the, National Convention, uh, the National Convention, of course, said, enough, uh, it's not working. So they switched to what is uh, to the strategy that Mahan says it's bad, the, what I call the indirect strategy. So I defined it earlier. Second, uh, second point of my PhD, after the thing that the French did seek uh, command of the sea, after 1795, they do not uh, want to have command of the sea because if, uh, they think it's uh, impossible. So was the indirect strategy so bad, uh, as bad as uh, Mahan would tell it? 
I do not think so. Of course, it wasn't the best scenario. I, I do not disagree on um, on paper. I do not disagree with man. Of course, the best strategy is to stick and destroy the the, the 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 enemy fleet. But when you can't, what do you do? And uh, the, um, I think the strategy uh, defended by, defended by uh, the French was not that bad. Not of course, excellent. Was not that bad. What did they do? Of course, all the things I've said. Uh, colonial strategy in the um, um, in the anti in the Caribbean. Uh, you got, of course, with the tool of the abolition of slavery, slavery the French Navy with very small craft tried to uh, run from the British take some uh, merchant men, uh, dis uh, disembark some uh, soldiers to say, to, f to create some uh, sl um, uh, slavery revolt. Mm -hmm. the, it, it was very effective, as you know. Um, there was, uh, in, uh, in front of the French, there was the Abercrombie, <laughs> mm -hmm. the Abercrombie uh, expedition, who was, so it, in the end it was a draw, but with a very, very, much less, uh, uh, much less money and people spent on this uh, place by the French. So it was quite a, a success. Mm. Of course, you've got um, all the, the, the strategy of hunting convoys. And that's the biggest success of the French Navy. I'll talk about it later because we have a question uh, about these things. And you've got, of course, uh, all uh, the, the tentative uh, when they try to disembark people uh, the French army on uh, Ireland, on and even on um, on the British mainland. So it was uh, it wasn't successful. It wasn't successful for Ireland, but it was, of course, what man would call a fleeting being because it was menacing. So uh, it, the French uh, the French the French navy of Brest was very menacing. Something important to understand from a French uh, French point of view is that the three big uh, blows to the French Navy of the period are Toulon, 1793, the Nile, which uh, in French we call Aboukir. If you're doing research about it, you've got to, mm -hmm. to write Aboukir, because the Nile, nobody knows in France what it is. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> and of course uh, Trafalgar. These three uh, moments were about the Mediterranean fleet. Mm. The, the, the breast fleet, the ocean fleet, was never destroyed. So, uh, why is it important? Because um, the memory, the, the work about the French, the, the ocean fleet, is way more mitigated. Because, uh, and you can stress the, the effectiveness, limited, of course, the limited effectiveness of the, uh, the breast fleet. Well, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. And again, uh, it's all, all of this is very enlightening. I mean, it almost sounds like the French strategy at sea. I mean, was, I mean, uh, I will, I'm going to embarrass myself and try to translate it. Um, it's almost like in my head, uh, uh, Petit Guerre oui. de Mer. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. this episode with Olivier Aranda. This is going to be uh, the first part of two episodes, and so please come back for the next one where Olivier will elaborate on this Petit Guerre de la Mer and the wider French naval strategy of the French Revolution. See you again for the next adventure in history land. Please like and subscribe, and have a great morning, noon, and night, wherever you are.